Bangladesh issue is lots of people coming here. Uh, they problem with their language, problem their jobs, so we need help. Also, their residents, a lot of people has no houses around here. So, like four or five people living in one bedroom because of they have no family uh, help for the housing. So we need uh, help with the housing, uh, which is senior citizen housing also Bangladeshi people not have. And we, we are not uh, having any help like from the government, what kind of benefit we can get it, a lot of people don't know. I was in Bangladesh, 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 अत खाओ खोरज गुलाम अगर कैसे मानो है जे ठीक आज एक उन्हों भाल लाख चिना वो भावे अतो भालो लाख चिना बट उधर शॉप किस्सू ये मानी उधर शॉप नियम शॉप किच्छी अनेक मार्जितो अनेक भाल लगे I would say primarily Bangladesh would be my home living here I feel biased sometimes because of culture I would say religion because sometimes when you go with the friends here they, they want to eat like uh, some of the food that is not halal. So we have like more of, most of their friends I could I can go with them with a the club or something else, you know. There's Sere Asha Erokum Kichuna, Ami just DBT RC, Rotary Winko RC, just A Shabi Asha. आर आशा पूर्व भाव वाला ठेके जावा तो आमी मने कोरे जो कम्युनिटी मानुष देर एदेशे कम्युनिटी शरी मिशा उचित एदेशे नियम कानून जगुलो आसे एगुलो मेने चला उचित आर स्टेट फेडरल जेसो मस्त वागुलो आसे एगुलो अनुश्रवण करा उचित एवं अमेरिका ते बशवश कड़ा व्यवस्था एदेशे आयन नियम एवं जगुलो � I left Bangladesh 1993, January 30th, because my father was here. So he was immigrant. He sponsored us to brought us here. We are five brothers over here, all joint family. We had lived together, one family. We cook together. We sit together three times a day. We live, uh, eat together mostly. And our parents is very, very happy parents because we all live together, five brothers. There is very minority people have like that kind of happen. Five brothers living together. All of we are married, and we have all children living together, all going school. As a community, we should more look into education. I work in a bank currently, and I see a lot of people doesn't have education, and with lack of education, they are they are really, really they don't understand how to do a transaction. They are very scared. They don't express themselves. They rely on other people. So some people get really screwed because they don't know the language itself. And language is a primary issue, I think. When I came here, my main problem is uh, I, I was came alone, and I knew very little people. And main problem is unity. And I don't think so. Housing is main problem because each and everyone is working, and they are more or less they are earning money. So if we have proper unity, then we can overtake any kind of problem. That's all. All right, as we just saw, coming to a new country, especially for the middle aged, can lead to an identity crisis, which is what a large number of Bangladeshi, Nepali, Indian, and Pakistani immigrants go through. Ethnic identity comes face to face with environmental obstacles, barriers within American society, and a loss of familial support in general. Despite the promise of their new home, they must often cope with an inability to have the best of both worlds. The same holds true for people who have come from Arabic-speaking nations, and in the aftermath of 9-11, both communities live in relative isolation, isolated by fear and often with little opportunity to break out of poverty. Both groups also encounter discrimination that prevents many from fully participating in education, work, recreation, or finding housing. Here to help us better understand their situation and their experiences are Mohammed Razvi, Executive Director of the Council of People's Organization, 
which works with South Asians in Coney Island. Welcome, Mohammed. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. And Seema Agnani, Executive Director of Chaya CDC, which has very strong ties to the Bangladeshi community. Welcome. Thank you. And from the Arab American Family Support Center, we're also really happy to have Jamal Al-Saraj here. He's the manager of its anti-violence program. Hey, Jamal. Thank you. And Shumi Akhtar, she's the supervisor of the center's general preventative services. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. All right, Thank we're you. happy to have you in the studio. We were just out in the community uh, two days ago and shot that video, just talking to people on the street. And I guess one thing I'm struck by is Brooklyn is a place of immigrants. You know, we're all from somewhere else, mainly. I wonder, from your perspectives, what uh, the Southeast Asian communities or South Asian communities can benefit from others' experience? What sort of things that you'd like to see the community take and move forward with, Mo? Well, the most important thing is um, just like all community and immigrants that come, they become and they come to a particular place. Mm -hmm. The place that you visited was uh, known as Little Bangladesh. There's also Little Pakistan. Yeah. There's also Little, you know, little uh, Mexico. And each of these communities, as they come here, they go to those same places and they try to work together and they look out for each other. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't work out that way. Um, whether it's the uh, even the Jewish, there's little Israel right on Coney Island Avenue alongside this route. And in little Israel, they've prospered, they've worked hard, and they've done better. Mm -hmm. And this is how these communities are going to work hard. You know, it's going to take time and prosper and do better. You know, that, that's always been the formula. That's what we're told, like you get together in the sort of bootstraps theory, and they're helping each other out. But there's also a sense that the broader community and certainly the city should also be helping to raise everyone up out of poverty. Yeah. I mean, I think the difference now is that, you know, New York City has been going through a housing crisis for the last 30, 40 years. And this population grew at a time when they really, our city was kind of out of housing. Yeah. Um, and so has ended up in extremely overcrowded conditions. Um, and also because, you know, I saw in the video they mentioned the, one person mentioned the lottery visa, right. you know, um, those who are immigrating here to New York City come from very different backgrounds, you know, because um, they're not necessarily people coming for education or with an educational background. Mm -hmm. So they face other barriers as well, you know. Um, English, um, as well as even mm -hmm. uh, literacy in their own languages sometimes. Now you touch on <laughs> housing, literacy, English. What, if anything, are your organization doing to help people and reach out and get people involved in, you know, in, in aiding them? So um, our organization, um, myself and Shumi, we work at the Arab American Family Support Center. We see things really holistically, and as such, we provide wraparound services. So. Um, we touched on some issues already, housing, um, sense of belonging in your new communities, and in addition to ESL and civic courses, we do uh, after-school youth academic support for people starting anything from 7 all the way up through 18, leading into college readiness. Um, we have uh, programs to help people who are going through any sort of community or intimate partner violence. So we really like, we see things at the forefront of uh, all sorts of layers of, I guess, oppression or struggle for those who are no immigrants. Um, people need things on different levels, and we don't see each immigrant as having that prototype yeah. immigrant experience either. Um, you know, I, I think about that when I'm doing my work in my anti-violence program. You have to take everyone for where they're at in their life and, and rely on them to be the experts of what they know they need and what they know they may not need. So um, it's very adaptable programming we provide. I'm very proud of it. Yeah. Um, so one of the other programs is uh we have the first uh, Halal Senior Center yeah. for South Asians and Arabs. We actually have staff that's hired to speak seven different languages. Seven different staff speak those seven different languages. Only seven. <laughs> Only seven. Um, but the important thing is, um, like you're mentioning, uh, we're talking about now immigrants, when they come, when these, especially these seniors, when they right. first came, they thought they were going to be here for five years, and then they were going to go back to mm -hmm. their countries. They were going to make the money and go back. It doesn't happen. Yeah. 25 years later, they're still here. They actually have brought their children here and their kids, like myself, you know, I'm raised here. Right. This is where I want to be. My kids are raised here. They're going to stay here. Right. So the important thing is many of these elders did not have, you know, how to save money for their uh, retirement, right. for their, uh, you know, old age. They never thought about that. They actually always worked in these places, right. odd jobs, and just 
provided for their families, not just here, but also back at home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's a big issue that our community members, all the immigrant community, what they do is they actually, I mean, one family is probably supporting at least 20 families. Shumi, yeah. I want to bring you in on the conversation. I know that we talked about all these different layers, and there's no sort of one story of anyone coming here. So how do you guys tackle that? Jamal mentioned there's a sort of multidisciplinary approach, but you cover everything from intimate partner violence to getting uh, new moms ready for the challenges ahead. This is... Um Related to uh, what Jamal said, uh, we face a cross-cultural uh, conflict, and one of them is when they come here, they have to rebuild their life from the beginning. Right. And one of the issues, well, not one, few of the issues that they face is child welfare laws, along with domestic violence, corrupt punishment, education mm -hmm. and neglect. And because of the language barrier, um, they do face a tremendous amount of um, stress as far as also confusion of where the resources are. So this is where we come in. We provide one-on-one uh, -on -one domestic violence counseling, parenting skills to help the parent understand um, in terms of school, how to relate to the we have caseworkers that helps them with, you know, go to the school right. or any public assistance that if they need to. We actually, when a family comes to us, we assess the family's needs, and most of them are public assistance and housing is one of the issues that she discussed. Yeah. Um, also, um, education, uh, education neglect uh, when they don't go, and then. Some also uh, the language where it you know falls into the category yeah. um, where they're not able to when the children uh, don't have the language I mean they have the language barrier right. and uh, we are able to actually provide that um, program we have after school program in Brooklyn now we're having one in Queens it didn't start yet but it will during the summer that's great. Um, Mohammed, you had brought up uh, generational kind of differences. Um, what are the differences in people that were born in another country and came here versus new generations that will have been born here? Well, first of all, the, when families bring their children who are in the teens, they're in a culture shock. Yeah. But the families who are bringing kids who are six years old or you know, in elementary school and those adolescent so age, it's easy. It's much easy to yeah. assimilate. The ones who are actually the 16-year-olds or the 13-year-olds and up, that's where the culture shock happens because individuals are trying to, at that point, they're actually trying to find their identity. Yeah. More importantly, they've lost their identity back at home. Right. Uh, we call them, you know, here we have a term, it's called, you know, Daisy's uh, American born and confused. Yeah. You know, and many times it, it happens, these kids, they assimilate more and they try to be more American than Americans. American. Well, and, and what do your organizations do, go ahead, to help people with this culture shock when they're in America? Yeah, I wanted to respond to Mohammed. You said a, a great point earlier about um, people's conception of the immigrant story. I mean, it's rooted in the American history around immigration, but for some of our families, even the youth, and particularly the youth, they're, they're coming here, but they're keeping ties because maybe in the summer they go back to their, their or their family's uh, country of origin, right. stay for a long time, they'll study there or study here. So they have, uh, I think, a really uh, dynamic conception of what culture is. You know, I do a lot of um, work around cities, with, around the city with different agencies, other service providers, community organizers and activists, and I think a really big point that I learned, even um, applying it to myself as an, um, as an immigrant too, and the work that I do is that culture is not the static notion. It's a very dynamic experience. And a lot of the young people we work with, um, it's, it's dangerous to go in with the assumption that uh, because they've been here for a while, you know, or even how they experience that shock. And I put it in parentheses because um, I also want to root, I think, our conversation in the idea that it, sometimes the narrative becomes a very victim-heavy narrative yeah. across the whole board. Yeah. But we're very strengths-based, you know, yeah. across all our programming. We see that families, individuals, young people have a lot to offer um, when we do college readiness or when I run after-school groups with teens, particularly boys. We anchor a lot of the work we do around w who they want to be in that identity formation, but in who they know they already are and what they're bringing from their home country. Seema, I know that you guys are working a lot with civic engagement and we celebrated so much like this last election with like the first Mexican American person. The yeah. numbers in the community are growing. Where yeah. is the political power yeah. and your representative coming from? 
I mean, it's pretty exciting, actually. There's a lot of activism in this community, yeah. and people are engaged. Um, you know, we are doing voter education work, GOTV work, you know, knocking on doors, and the response has been overwhelming. I think that um, the community is very well aware of what, you know, their responsibility is in many ways. You know, particularly those from Bangladesh, I feel, because it's a it's recently gone through an independent struggle, right. they have sort of really a exercise. culture of yeah. needing to be um, active in, in local um, issues. And so, um, you know, and also the other thing that happened in this last year is that because the Asian Indian population reached um, a, a sort of level where the Voting Rights Act kicked in, and so, um, the uh, Board of Elections was required to provide translated ballots this yeah. um, past election for the first time, and we were able to get uh, Bengali, Punjabi, and um, I think Urdu translation available in certain districts within Queens um, where there's a strong enough population. You know, so, so there is this um, growing capacity, and we see the naturalization rates going up, and so as people are becoming naturalized, they're yeah. registering to vote. Um, and I, I would say that the Bangladeshi community in Jackson Heights um, really is a force in terms of that district. Um, you know, in the last election, yeah. we held a candidate forum um, uh, around the Queensboro president's, um, um, you know, seat. And, you know, the turnout for that forum was phenomenal. And I think for the first time, we as a coalition of groups um, we're able to hold those electeds accountable to our community. That's great. With so many different issues, so many different people and types of people, what do you see, um, you know, thinking long term in the, over the next 10 years or so, what do you see as the most important steps to accomplish in helping people? Well, one of the most important things is with the families uh, teaching them, you know, especially the new immigrants, ESL classes that we're teaching also, um, and making them understand the society and the system that's in place. Many individuals, I mean, for the first time, um, our organization and Arab American Family Support Center is actually working with, have, we have navigators to do Obamacare enrollment. Yes. And we are at over, I would say, at least 180% of what we were supposed to provide, how many enrollments that we were supposed to do, and it's continuous. Um, providing them other services that they need, the guidance, that's a key issue. The guidance, especially for these kids, when they're coming in with their families who do not understand the educational system, we're taking them hand in hand. This is what you have to do. You have to let your daughters go to college. Mm. That's another issue. Many of the members who are coming here, they're in the perception, oh, the girls are supposed to stay home. No, they don't. They go to college. They should be studying. They should be also progressing. So what can we as a city and the larger community in Brooklyn and beyond do to sort of push this further to help the community, to build those bridges so it's not an isolated, like when I read that number that they're poorer than black people and Latin people, I'm like, really, there's somebody poorer than us? <laughs> like I, like I, I was flabbergasted. So what can we do in the broader sense to help out as a city? It's shocking. When I heard yeah. those statistics, I was even, you know, a little uh, surprised, but you know, I think that like other communities, so language access continues to be a key issue, um, making sure that services are available in multiple languages, you know, healthcare, housing, and economic development. These are there are all pieces to the puzzle, right? Um, and and this administration is aware of this community's needs, and we really need to make sure that they uh, respond to it. You know, um, I think that. Um, for the first time, we're in um, a pretty great environment in terms of the administration and the council being aware of um, this community and its needs. And, uh, you know, I think now it's about really making sure that they respond, you know. And so it includes mm -hmm. getting resources into these communities mm -hmm. so our organizations and others can really provide these services and support, you know? It's clearly a very uh, complicated and important conversation that's going to be ongoing. We, we only have a few minutes. How do people get involved in your organization specifically, people that maybe want it, uh, watching and want to get involved? So they can go out our website, copousa.org. Um, they can send an email to uh, myself or one of the workers, and or they can call the phone number 718-434-3266. And uh, the other important thing is for them to disseminate the information to other community members that need that help. 
I mean, all the services, all of our groups are providing multi-level services. It's a one-stop shopping center, mm -hmm. whether it's my organization or the Arab American Family Store or, or Chaya, because we are interconnected. We have a network and we forward you know, the nice. clients. That's How do they know. get in touch with you guys, Shumi? Uh, we mostly, our program um, focuses on uh, domestic violence and corporal punishment, so uh, related to what the last question you had. I would say that education is, um, it, I mean, providing, just like she said, services and yeah. education, parenting skills and domestic violence is a huge problem in our community. And I would like to, you know, have more programs in various languages. Yeah. This is one of the pro in a problem uh, Jamal and I were having, uh, trying to reach out to uh, different variety of services, however language varies, and it's a huge, you know, issue. So parenting skills right. and domestic violence would be the Thank program. you. So just, Jamal, give us a website where we can sure. get in touch. or So interest. we have a Queen's office where Shumi is in a Brooklyn office. Our um, website is aafscny.org, um, 718-643-8000, and for Shumi's office, 718-937-8000. All right, you've got the last word. How do we get in touch? <laughs> ChayaCDC.org, two H's, C-H-H-A-Y-A-C-D-C.org. Thank you very much, Thank all you. of you, for being Appreciate here. It. Thank you for having Thank me. You. Thank you. Absolutely.